Dr. Moore. We want to thank you for tuning in tonight, whether it be by Facebook or YouTube. We're still studying from this new study uh, in regards to living life in the spirit. Uh, the first lesson deals with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. On last week, we pretty much uh, took the time out to do some uh, background study on regards to who Mark is. Uh, we discovered uh, from the book of uh, Acts that Mark was a contemporary of um, uh, the Apostle Peter. He also was a missionary partner with uh, Paul, or known as Saul at the time, uh, as well as Barnabas. He was a young man, and at some point in the ministry of doing missionary work, he um, left the work and returned back home. And then there came a point in Paul and uh, Barnabas' life to say, that, hey, let's go back and check back up on the churches uh, that we've established. And the scripture says that Barnabas wanted to take with them again John Mark. And the scripture says, but uh, Paul uh, refuted with Barnabas. He says he forsook the work, uh, let's not take him. And they had a heated dispute over this man by the name of John Mark. And uh, they split. Uh, the scripture says that uh, Barnabas took uh, John Mark with him and Paul chose a new missionary partner by the name of Silas. And then they went around with the favor of the church, um, um, strengthening the churches. And so that some highlights pretty much of what we looked at last week. Who is this man by the name of John Mark? Uh, again, John Mark, uh, he drew all the memories of the apostle Peter in writing this um, gospel called uh, the Gospel of Mark. And so I want to pick back up in Mark chapter 1 tonight, verses 1 through 8. Again, this lesson deals with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the main idea of this lesson is that spirit baptism, not water baptism, um, spirit baptism is an inner act that purifies your soul and your spirit. You know, water baptism occurs when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then you're baptized as a follower. But the spirit baptism occurs the moment you accept Christ. He comes into your heart, into your life, and, and you're sealed as a child of God. And so as a believer, we're first sealed with the Spirit of God when we repent and ask Jesus to save us. And then we follow through with water baptism to identify with our relationship with Christ. And so the spirit baptism is the one that we need more than anything is to be to, to be uh, in a right relationship with God. Uh, water baptism does you no good except you be spirit baptized first. And the only way that spirit baptism happens is when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and his spirit comes upon you and lives within you. And so that's what we want to um, look at tonight. And uh, we'll just kind of work our way through the text uh, again. But we always start off with a song. Uh, there is um, no hymn book out tonight. But um, there are songs that deal with the Holy Spirit that we sing in the church. And um, there's one that says, Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, O comforter and friend. How we need your touch again. Yes. Holy Spirit, rain down. Yes. Let your power fall. Let your voice be heard. Let your power fall as we stand on your word. Holy Spirit, rain down. And so just like we talked about last week, it's, uh, it's very important that we yield to God's presence and power every day. We wake up and we say, Holy Spirit, fill me with your presence and with your power so that I may live a victorious life in the power of your spirit. Um, just like we need continual filling in our um, gas tanks. Uh, if not, we're going to run out of gas, spiritually speaking. And we talked about what happens when we run out of spiritual gas. Um, we lean to the form of flesh. Uh, we're not doing the things that please God. Uh, we find ourselves committing adultery, lying, murder, fornication, theft, murders, um, you name it, those are um, 
things that identify with the flesh. But when we're spirit filled, it says that we are filled with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. And so um, those are the evidence, whether you're living in the spirit or you're living in the flesh. And Paul talks about that in the book of Galatians, that the deeds of the flesh are evident. And the first thing he mentions was sexual sin. He says uh, adultery, fornication. And then he talks about murder and theft and uh, whispering and backbiting and lying and theft and uh, you name it. These are evident that you're walking in the flesh. But when you're filled with the spirit, you can forgive, you can love, um, you can um, live a life that pleases God. And so this simple song is a, a simple song that says, Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down. O comforter and friend, how we need your touch again. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down. Uh, let your power fall. Let your voice be heard. Uh, let your power fall as we stand on your word. Holy Spirit, rain down. Now, so we'll sing that a couple of uh, times, and then we'll move into um, uh, brief prayer, and then we'll go into uh, Mark chapter 1 tonight, verses 1 through 8. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, O Comforter and Friend. How we need your touch again. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down. Let your power fall, let your voice be heard. Let your power fall as we stand on your word. Holy Spirit, <coughs> rain down. Let's go back to the top. Holy Spirit, rain down. Rain <coughs> down. Oh, pa. oh, comforter and friend. How we need your touch again. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down. Let your power, let your power fall. Let your voice be heard. Let your power fall as we stand on your word. Holy Spirit, rain down. One more time from the top. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down. O comforter, O comforter and friend. How we need your touch again. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain, rain down. Let your power fall. Let your voice be heard. Let your power fall as we stand on your word. Holy Spirit, rain down. Amen. Father in heaven, we come. We acknowledge tonight that you are God and that Jesus Christ is your son, who is God, and that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God, he is God. And so we come before you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true God of heaven and earth, the maker of all things, visible and invisible. 
In you we live, we move, and we have our being. And apart from you, we can do nothing. Uh, because of you, Lord, we have our breath. And we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you most of all for the gift of your son, the one who gave his life so that our lives may be rescued from sin, from Satan, and from eternal destruction. Your word says who the son sets free is free indeed. And so we thank you for our freedom tonight. Freedom no longer to live for ourselves, but freedom um, to live a life that pleases God. Tonight, Lord, we recognize that we have not um, kept your word in all its fullness, and we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. And so we take this time out to say, forgive us. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, in word or in deed or in action. Forgive us for the wrong that we've done against you and against others. We confess our sins and we ask that you would cleanse us from this, from the, the guilt of our sin and purify our hearts from all unrighteousness. Lord, we also pray for those families that are grieving the loss of loved ones, these children that was gunned down in the school. We pray, God, even for uh, the person, Lord, that took the life of um, these children. We pray for their her family because they're also grieving the loss of their child, Lord, who took her own life uh, or who took whose life was taken by the police because of the crime that she has committed. And so, God, we pray that you would comfort those hearts that grieve on both ends. And we pray, God, that uh, we realize, Lord, that it's the enemy that's at work behind people that are committing these crimes because Jesus said in, uh, in the gospel of John, it is the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But you come that we may have life and have it more abundantly. And so, God, we pray that people will recognize that uh, we have a real enemy, and he is the devil. But Jesus defeated the works of the devil when he went to the cross hung, bled, and died between two thieves, but rose the third day. He, he conquered death because he paid the price for our sins. And we no longer have to live in sin. We can choose Jesus and experience the abundant life. And so, Father, we pray tonight that as we study the word, we pray that someone would choose life tonight, that they would choose to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit and, and resist the devil so that he may flee from us, that we may draw near to God and he will draw near to us. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit will empower us, that he would be the one who proclaims the truth found in your word tonight. Use us as vessels to proclaim the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, thank y'all for coming out tonight. Again, we're, we studied... Uh, started a new study on last week uh, dealing with living in the spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy is what we discover when we live life in the spirit. Um, we begin uh, lesson number one doing the background study on who uh, John Mark is. Uh, we discover that John Mark was a contemporary of the Apostle Peter, but he was also a missionary partner with uh, Paul along with Barnabas. Uh, but he forsook the work, and um, there was a time when um, Barnabas and Paul wanted to return to the churches that they had established on their first missionary journey, and they got into a heated dispute about John Mark going back with them on this second uh, journey. And so they were not able to agree. And so they disagreed and Mark uh, went with Barnabas and Paul chose a new missionary partner by the name of Silas, but they continued the work. And so this lesson deals with the main ideal that spirit baptism is an inner act that purifies your soul and your spirit. And so it's an inward act of God. The moment you believe the gospel, the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit comes upon you and he baptizes you into the life of Christ. 
that is the church. And so the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're baptized with the Spirit of God. And then you follow through with your baptism of the Spirit with water baptism. That's when you come before the church, says Christ is now my Savior and my Lord, and I want to follow him, and then I want to be baptized. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses what, 19 and 20, known as the Great Commission. Jesus commands the church to go into the world and preach the gospel to every soul baptize those who believe the gospel, those who would repent of their sins, those who accept Christ as their Savior, baptize these new disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we have to teach these new believers to observe all the teachings of Christ. And he says, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And so that's Matthew chapter 28, Verses 19 and 20, known as the Great Commission. The question that we looked at last week is, why does God command me as a child of God to, to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, the Spirit lives in you, but we are commanded by God to be filled with the Spirit every day. In other words, um, just because you took a bath yesterday, you can get dirty today. And you need to go back and take another bath today, right? So you can't say like they said on the cowboy movies. Remember, they only took baths on Saturday back in the Western days, according to the Westerns that we watch. Um, we get dirty every day. Uh, we live in the world, and the world is full of sin, and we come in contact with people, amen, who may rub us the wrong way, spiritually speaking, and we may pop off at the mouth, <laughs> We may say something that we regret later. Uh, we, we, we're full of anger and bitterness and hatred and resentment. Those things can still happen to Christians. So that's why we need every day to come before God and say, God, forgive me. I have sinned. And I ask today that you would what uh, fill me with your spirit once again so that as I go into this new day, I'm going to live it uh, empowered by the spirit. And so to lead this lesson aim, the teaching aim is to lead adults to learn that being baptized in the Holy Spirit means to be totally immersed in the life of God. Be, in other words, you are totally controlled by God's spirit. Your thought life, uh, the, the words that you say, the places that you go, how you encounter people, how you react to uh, negative and positive situations, all that should be under the control of the spirit. Um, it says here, understanding the context. As John Mark, drawing on the memories of Peter, that is the apostle Peter, you know, he was original apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter was what, uh, a fisherman by trade. He had a brother named um, Andrew and um and so John Mark is drawing on the memories of Peter and other eyewitnesses when he wrote about Jesus in this gospel known as the gospel of Mark. And the underlying question and the organizing principle of his thought was, who is this guy, Jesus? That's what John Mark is trying to relate to his audience. Who is Jesus? And the, the essential question of Mark's gospel is, who is Jesus? We find this question on the lips of the disciples in Mark 441, after Jesus calmed the sea. Remember, Jesus calmed in the sea. If you got your Bibles, turn quickly to Mark chapter 4, verse 41. Again, they want to know who Jesus is. And so... We remember that they caught, they were caught up in a storm and Jesus spoke to the winds and calmed the sea. And the question was asked by the disciples. Look at uh, Mark chapter four. Um, let's start with verse 35 and we'll read to verse 41. Who could read that for us? Give us the whole background. Jesus said to the disciples, 
let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? Mm -hmm. They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obeyed him. Okay. And so one of the primary questions that Mark is trying to uh, get us to see in the gospel of Mark is who is this man, right? Um, now, do y'all know anybody that y'all have met any time <laughs> lately that can just stand up in the midst of a tornado, that can stand up in the midst of a raging sea and say, be muzzled? Because that's pretty much what uh, the translation of what Jesus said was peace be still. And in other words, he was telling the sea, put a muzzle on it. <laughs> Shut up. Be quiet. Stop your raging. And soon as he said those words, guess what? There was a great calm, right? Because he's the creator. Uh, Jesus created the heavens and the earth. And so he's in control of the heavens and the earth. And he left the disciples saying, who is this guy that even the winds and the waves obey him? In other words, they realize this, not, this is not some ordinary guy. We cannot put Jesus on the same level as other men. We can't put him on the same level as Muhammad, uh, as Confucius, as Gandhi, um, you name it. We can't put Jesus and say, well, he was just another great guy, like some of the guys that we know um, or people that have been mentioned in the past. He's, he's on a total different level. He's God manifested in human flesh. And so only God can control the seas, right, and the waves and the winds and say, be muzzled. And they obey. Now, if Jesus had said, be muzzled and obey, and the ship would have continued to fill up and the disciples would have drowned, then Jesus was not God. But if someone can speak to the winds and the waves and they obey, it leaves you the question, what kind of God is this, right? And so that's what John is trying to relate in this gospel. Who is this God? Uh, also, uh, we look at um, the same question is asked um, in uh, Mark chapter 8 uh, when Jesus asked a question in Mark 8, 27 through 29. Let's look at that. Mark chapter 8, 27 and 29, uh, where Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And let's see the response of the people. Uh, we'll look at um, verses um, 27 through 29. Verse 27, chapter 8. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the town of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, and by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answered and said unto them, Thou art the Christ. Okay. And so here we see again, that's why I said we can't put Jesus on the same level, even with great men of the Bible, right? Because when he asked him, who do men say that I am? And there was a consensus among the people. They said, well, some say that you're what? John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist was what? Uh, the first cousin of Jesus. He was the, uh, the forerunner of Jesus, preparing Jesus' arrival to the nation of Israel, telling them that he is their Messiah. He is their Savior. 
Uh, some said he's Elijah. Now, Elijah was one of the greatest Old Testament prophets there is. Elijah would tell you, choose today whom you will serve. If God is God, serve God. If Baal is the real God, then you serve Baal. And then Elijah could say, Lord, uh, prove to these people that you are the living God. Rain down fire on this um, altar and consume this water and, and this calf. And the scripture says, and when Elijah prayed that prayer, guess what? Fire from heaven came down, licked up all the water in the trough, uh, consumed the altar, consumed the calf. And um, that's the type of man that Elijah was. Elijah could go to your house and your son be laying dead and he would breathe over your child and your child come back to life. A very powerful man of God. Elijah uh, was not, uh, didn't die. The scripture says that a chariot of fire came down and took Elijah to heaven where he did not see death. This is the man that they said, where well, you're in the likeness of Elijah. Then some would say, well, you're just like in the realm of other prophets of God, right? In other words, men that God had used in the Old Testament to reveal uh, the nation of Israel and call them to repentance. And as the scripture says, but um, that's who they say you are. But Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, if you look at this from another gospel standpoint, in, in the gospel of Matthew, the scripture says, uh, Peter uh, being filled with the Spirit, says you are the Christ. The word Christ means anointed one. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus would say, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah. This is in what Matthew 16. Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Amen. Right? And so we can't put Jesus on the same level as other men, even if they're great men of God. Uh, he is the unique one and only son of God, the savior of the world. And so let's look at some of the uh, scriptures in Mark chapter one. We want to look at the beginning of the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And if I heard somebody say that I made a mistake today and I turned on the news, because guess what's on the news? Bad news. Because if you look at the news, all it does is tell you what happened in the world, right? More killings, more um, shootings at schools. Um, but someone actually made that comment, and I can't remember who it was, but they said, huh? I was trying to think too. They said, I made a mistake today and I turned on the news. Well, when you open up the Bible, especially the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the word gospel means good news. Okay. Yeah. So she made the mistake and turned on the news, and it's all full of bad news. But well, when, when, when we look at the Gospels, the gospel is about the good news, about God sending his son into the world. And so let's mark introduce his work with two important identity markers of Jesus. That is, he is the Christ. Christ is the first of these. And in the Greek, the rendering of the Hebrew word is Messiah. Within the culture of Second Temple Judaism, Christ or Messiah had a very political overtone. First century Jews were looking for a Messiah or Christ. That, that shared many similarities with King David. You know, one of the greatest kings that the nation of Israel had was King David, right? Um, David was the one that defeated Goliath. David was the one that was um, chased um, nearly half of his young adult life by the first king, King Saul. David was a military genius. Um, he established the nation of Israel. He unified the kingdom of God. And, uh, and so the nation um, was, was prosperous under King David, and, but they had lost all of that. And now they were looking for a Messiah king, one who would come uh, with the, the political might that David had, military leadership like David had. They were looking for a man who could help Israel regain its 
geographical and geo, geopolitical independence once again. Now keep in mind at this time that the Israelites are in their own land, but they're under Roman occupation. Rome tells them what to do. Rome allows them to keep their religion, but they got to pay taxes to Rome. Can't you imagine um, being free? It's kind of like uh, uh, African-Americans. Even though we were free by the Emancipation Proclamation, we still didn't have no place to go, still didn't have no land. Uh, and so we were free, but yet and still other people were telling us how to live our lives. That's what the nation of Israel were under. Rome said you could have your own religion, but you have to pay us taxes. You are under our control. And so they were under the political domination of Rome. And they were looking for someone like King David to come and free them uh, from this what political occupation of the Romans. And so, um, and so Mark is letting us know that Jesus Christ is that Messiah. He is that um, Christ that they were looking for. So let's look at um, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. And we'll do some um, study on that. Um, chapter 1, verse 1. Yes, sir. Uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay, so let's take a look at that. What do you see from that one verse? How does it describe Christ? The Son of God. Okay. Uh, the Messiah. My is the Messiah. Okay. So right from the beginning. Okay. And it's about good news, right? Now, keep in mind, brothers and sisters, before John the Baptist comes on the scene, the nation of Israel has not had a prophet speak from God in 400 years. And when Malachi ends, uh, we can go back a few chapters through books and we'll look at Malachi. You know, Malachi is the last Old Testament book of the prophets in our, in our uh, Bible, Malachi. So the nation of Israel has not heard a word from God through a prophet in over 400 years. But notice in um, Malachi chapter four, I believe it is where we need to uh, uh, identify. Malachi chapter four, starting with verse one, it says, for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up. Now, this is a day of judgment, y'all. Says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise. In other words, there's going to be a, a different outcome for those who are wicked versus those who what are righteous. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings and you shall go out and grow fat like stall fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Mount Horeb for all Israel with the statues and judgments. No, that takes us back to Exodus chapter 20, where God gives them the commandments, right? Behold, I will send Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And that was the last word they heard from God in 400 years. And then when Mark uh, comes and writes the gospel, he says, guess what? I got good news. 
the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. So the good news is about a person, right? And that person is Jesus Christ or the Messiah. Now, Jesus Christ is not the, the Messiah that they wanted, right? Have God ever gave you your heart's desire above what you wanted? See, we've been asking God for certain things, but God gives you more or greater things than what you need. The Bible tells us God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask, think, or imagine. And so keep in mind, the Jewish nation is under Roman domination. They are being oppressed by the Romans. And God had promised a day that he would send the Messiah, right? But their thought of a Messiah is not what God had in mind. They wanted a political leader that would keep, that would wipe away the Romans and they would live back in them heydays of David. But here, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it identifies Jesus as the son of God. Remember uh, what the Lord said in regards to who Jesus was when he was baptized? Uh, Let's see if we can find that right quick. Let's go to Matthew chapter four. Let's see what God has to say concerning who Jesus Christ is. Because we discovered in Matthew chapter uh, 16 that men say that Jesus was like Elijah, like John the Baptist, like one of the other prophets. But what does God have to say about his son? Uh, let's look at, Matthew chapter four. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter three. Can I get someone to read um, verse 16 through 17? This concerns the baptism of Jesus. Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And book of verse 17, then they lo, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my son, beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay. And so we see at the baptism of Jesus, God identifies Jesus as his, what, beloved son, right? And so um, the one and only unique son of God, who was co-equal, co-eternal with God the Father from the beginning of time. And so, again, um, Mark identifies Jesus as the Messiah, uh, the long-awaited Messiah that they had been longing for. And then he identifies Jesus as being the unique son of God. Uh, this, again, the first mark is that Jesus was the Messiah. The second identity marker that Mark uh, paints for us in, in regards to Jesus, that he is the son of God. In other words, it says this was also a phrase with a history of interpretation and a series of preconceived hopes and expectations surrounding it. This is a phrase from the prophets. Daniel used this phrase. Invoking this title at the beginning of his book, Mark meant his readers to think about the promises of an end of the age and of divine salvation. A final item of note in verse one is that Mark used the phrase, the beginning of the gospel. The gospel is a Greek word meaning good news. So Mark signaled to his readers that all of the contents that followed was good news. So as we read the rest of the entire book of Mark, Mark says, this is good news. Uh, ain't no bad news in the gospel of Mark. Uh, furthermore, all of the contents that followed was only the beginning of the good news. His account of Jesus does not indicate 
an ending or a completion of God's action. On the contrary, Mark intended his gospel account to be the start of the continuing work of God in the world. Something new had happened in Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, and the impact of Jesus' work was just beginning. And so Mark is identifying Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, and that his writings about Jesus is nothing but good news. And so let's look at verses on two and three and see what we can highlight from those verses. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my Messiah before the place which shall prepare, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness is prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Okay, and so... Uh, let's take a look at that. Any highlights that y'all want to uh, bring out in those verses there? Is this, I just had a question on, on verse 2. Is it, is it written in the prophets? I send my Messiah. Yes, sir. Mark, this. Mark. this is Mark quoting. Because quoting. Uh, it starts by saying what, as it is written in the prophets. Okay. So now Mark is taking us back to what the Old Testament prophets had written concerning the coming of Jesus the Messiah. Uh, yes, sir. And so uh, Malachi chapter three, you know, we had just read uh, Malachi chapter four, right? That the Lord would send um, Elijah. Um, let's see what it says in uh, Malachi chapter three. Um, someone read Malachi chapter three, verse um, two. I'm sorry, verse one. Okay, and so now Mark is referring back to the prophets such as Malachi, because Malachi predicted that the Lord would send his what? Messenger. And guess who this messenger would be? Um, according to um, Mark chapter one. Huh? John the Baptist. All right. Remember Malachi chapter four, the Lord says, and I will send Elijah before that great and dreadful day. And so um, um, John the Baptist would be the fulfillment of Malachi chapter three or chapter four, where the Lord said he would send his messenger before uh, the Messiah's arrival. Right. And so from this brief introduction, Mark immediately quotes two passages from the prophets. Isaiah, being the greater prophet, gets the credit in Mark's reference. But Mark also uses a phrase from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, both passages are worth reading in their original context. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, God speaks through his prophet to promise a common messenger who would clear the way before him. God then would suddenly come to his temple. This is a passage about God's judgment upon the sins of his people who can endure the day of his coming. That would be Malachi 3 and 2. Before the Lord comes, though, God will send a messenger, right? Mark linked the message messenger of Malachi 3 with the voice that challenges all of, his, all of Israel to clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness according to Isaiah 40, verse 3. Like Malachi, Isaiah, was, Isaiah saw the clearing work as essential preparation for an unparalleled act of divine revelation. You know, back in those days, you no, know, they didn't have clear paved highways like we had. Um, they would have people who would go before a dignitary or a king and make clear his way, right? Make sure that the roads were clear for travel. Make sure there was no bandits hiding in the woods. And then they would also proclaim that the king is coming. 
The king is coming, right? And so that's what uh, John the Baptist um, um, ministry was all about. He was preparing the way for the arrival of the Messiah. He was preparing the way for the people to meet Jesus. Um, you know, we're in the same position as John the Baptist, I would say. You know, Jesus is coming back one day, right? And we are hairs of good news. We ought to be saying, hear ye, hear ye, Jesus is coming. No man knows the day or the hour. Prepare yourself to meet the Lord. Repent and everyone be baptized, right? We are heralds. We are proclaiming good news that Jesus Christ is coming. And that's what God predicted through the life of the prophets such as Isaiah and Malachi, that he would send his messenger before his coming preparing the people's way to meet their Messiah. Uh, in other words, it's saying this, here is your God, according to Isaiah 40, verse 9. Much of Mark's original audience would have been familiar, not only with the verses he quoted, but the context and the hopes attached to them. Mark was beginning his good news with an announcement that the day of divine visitation had arrived. In other words, your king is here. Uh, and so let's take a look at how this messenger that is getting ready to prepare the way for Jesus coming, how he appears on the scene. Let's look at verses four and uh, through six. And it gives us uh, the identification of this messenger. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Who would like to read Mark chapter 1, verse 4 through 6? John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they are... Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Four and five? Through six. Oh, and John was clothed with camel's hair, and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. Okay. Any comments, uh, highlights that you want to share in regards to who this messenger is, what he looked like? Um, what his um, message was? What John was uh, saying before the Messiah came? Did he, were he baptized in the wilderness? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Oh, basically, he was just um, coming into the people and <coughs> requesting that they re uh, repent. Okay. So, okay. So his message was about repentance, right? <laughs> he didn't have a name it and claim it message, reach up and grab it message, haul it and slab it message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, you guys need to repent. Uh, the Messiah is coming. The Savior is coming. In order to meet him, you need to repent of your sins, right? Well, who is this John? Because the scripture says John Cain. Uh, let's go to Luke. We, we get some uh, understanding of who this John is. Uh, because when names appear, we need to find out who is this John. Because this is not the only John in the Bible. Y'all know that, don't you? Yes. We have John the Baptist. We have John uh, the Apostle. Uh, we have served with John. So we need to know who this John is. Uh, let's look at um, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we'll start with um, verse 11, and we'll get an understanding of who this John the Baptist to be born, who he was, and what his ministry would be. Let's start with John chapter 1, and let's pick up with verse 11 and continue to read. I'm sorry, Luke. Thank you, brother. Luke 
chapter 1, starting with verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for the prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call him, shall call his name John. <clears throat> and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. All right, y'all see that? Mm -hmm. And so here is uh, Zechariah. He is the father of John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. He and his wife, Elizabeth, were faithful followers of God. Um, they were um, obedient to the law of God, but they desired children. Uh, never had any kids, praying for kids. And while he's what ministering in the temple, burning incense before God, an angel appears. Uh, many believe that this perhaps was uh, Gabriel because Gabriel was the same angel that appeared to Mary uh, while... Um, uh, while she was in her hometown, and he brings good news. He said, your prayers have been answered, Zechariah. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name, what, John, right? Well, the custom of that day was that you name your boy after, your, after his father. And so even when um, John the Baptist was born, um, we would, if we continue to read, you no, know, Zechariah would ask the angel, how can this be? Uh, he says, well, because you have not believed my words, you will not be able to speak until the birth of your son. And so that day that she was to give birth to John the Baptist, all the kid folks came over and said, girl, what you going to name that boy? <laughs> and they were thinking, well, he, his name is going to be uh, Zechariah Jr. And she said, no, his name shall be John, right? And so, well, we don't need to ask the wife. Let's go ask the husband. Mm -hmm. And he wrote on the tablet, his name is John. And that's when he was able to speak again. And so that's all in Luke chapter one. But notice here, it says concerning the ministry of John, and you will have joy and gladness. I'm back in Luke chapter one, 14. And many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be what great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall what drink neither wine nor strong drink. In other words, he will be a Nazarite. Those Nazarites were those Jews that took vows. Uh, they, would, um, they were not to cut their hair. They were not to hang around dead people. They were not to drink strong wine. Uh, and so he would be fully and wholly devoted to God from the moment of his birth. And the scripture says, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth. And he will what, turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, that is before Jesus the Messiah, in the power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John's ministry was to prepare people for the coming of the Messiah, which is Jesus. And so now that we go back to what uh, John and we describe in the ministry of John is a fulfillment of what the angel had already announced to Zechariah, what his son's ministry would be. And so when we go back to what Mark, I'm sorry, Mark, Mark chapter one, and it describes the ministry of John. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance. Had the same message. 
He was preaching a baptism of repentance, right? John was not commissioned by God to, to, that the spirit of God come upon you, but John was preparing you for the one who could fill you with the spirit. And that was Jesus, right? So he was preaching a baptism of repentance for what? For the remission or for the forgiveness of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. If you couldn't confess your sins, you didn't get baptized. John said, I'm not baptizing you because I'm trying to open up a church and have the biggest church in, in Judea. That's not my ministry, right? And many of us try to mimic and copycat other people's ministries. Um, you have to have your own unique ministry that God gives you. My ministry is to prepare you to meet Jesus. If you want to be baptized by me, confess your sins to God. Get in this water and I will immerse you for the forgiveness of your sins. It says here, let me read some of these comments and then we'll close tonight. So keep in mind that he has a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Besides proclaiming the day of divine visitation, Mark also gave a name to the promised messenger who would clear the way for the Lord's coming. John the baptizer. Most translations still follow the traditional naming here by calling him John the Baptist. Now, John was not a Baptist. He was not a Methodist. He was not Episcopalian. The, the, the phrase Baptist is what he did. No, he was not the first Baptist preacher. We can't even take credit for that, right? <laughs> that John was a Baptist preacher. No, he was a preacher who baptized so they tagged him as John the Baptizer. And so the name Baptist refers to his activity, not to his denomination. <laughs> First century Jews did not uh, pass on family names like we do today, but they still found it necessary to differ differentiate between people with the same or similar first name. John was a common name. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, I've, a few people I've met or read named Cedric, but my name is spelled different from theirs. Most people spell Cedric C-E-D-C-E-D-R-I-C. -E -E well, my mama was happened to be watching General Hospital one day. <laughs> I asked my mama, where you get my name from? She said, oh, there was a man named Cedric on General Hospital. I said, okay, then. And so she spells my name S-E-D-R-I-C-K. And so I've met a few Cedrics in my lifetime, but their, their name, their spelling is totally different from mine most of the time. And so there was a lot of Johns in this day. And so in order to, differ, to, di, to differ this John from other Johns, they said this is the John, Mark said, that was baptizing people in the Jordan River as they came to what renounced their life of sin. And so that's what got, um, that's what John is trying to let us, Mark trying to let us know, that this John that I'm talking about was the one that was the baptizer. He was the one that was telling people, repent of your sins and be prepared to meet your Savior. And so we'll stop here tonight and we'll continue to pick up with this um, identification as to who John was and what John did in order to prepare people to receive spiritual baptism. So you can't have um, spiritual baptism unless you first repent of your sins uh, and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so we'll stop here tonight and we'll continue to look at verses four through six and moving forward as we continue to describe this good news that God is, has sent his son into the world to save sinners. We want to thank you for joining us tonight. We do pray that you have gotten some understanding as to who this John, John the baptizer is, that he is the one who um, led people um, to repent of their sins, 
uh, to be prepared to meet the Lord. And that's what our job is as the church today, is to prepare you, uh, those who are alienated from God, those who have sinned against God. Uh, we are, we're trying to prepare you to meet Jesus, girls. One day he is coming again. And he's coming for his church. Then he's coming to judge the world. And we want you to be a part of the church by repenting of your sins, telling God you're sorry for your life of sins. But in, the good news is that God's son came to die for your sins. And if you would fully repent and say, God, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to be forgiven. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. God will forgive you and your sins will be forgiven. And we thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, we invite you to come and worship with us on Sunday mornings, 10 o'clock. It's Sunday school. Morning worship starts at 11. Until that time, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you is our prayer.